Hi, everybody. I'm Tamara Zoner. And I'm John Davis. Welcome to Spirit Cafe. Come in, sit down, and... Grab a cup of love. A Spirituality Without the Guilt podcast. So, hi, guys. This is John Davis, and I'm here with the lovely Tamara Zoner. And we are here today at Spirit Cafe with our lovely mugs mugs of coffee here. (laughs) And we are going to be... Uh, talking today about a, a really interesting topic to me, uh, the correlation of love and fear as it pertains to spirituality. How are you today, Tamara? I am very well, John, and excited to talk about love and fear, but mostly love. <laughs> <laughs> well, well, that's amazing. That's amazing. So um, I, I know that you and I both have the same um, belief that God is love. And I'm real curious about how you came to that understanding. Oh, wow. No one's ever asked me that question before. (laughs) Unscripted, folks. Unscripted. (laughs) Uh, You know, I have always been this loving, bright, energetic person, right? From early, early child, probably from birth, right? But I don't remember that part. And I like we talked about in our last episode at church, I wasn't understanding because it felt too separate. Like certain people with different beliefs were, were not going to be, you know, experiencing what, what we in that particular Catholic church were. And I didn't get it. And I have always just felt like everyone deserves love. Everyone should have love. Everyone should feel loved. And uh, I think that as I moved through my adulthood and through challenges and coming through them, which I'm sure we'll talk about them one day on this podcast and coming to see that I could only truly influence myself. So I couldn't change any of the circumstances outside of me and I couldn't change any of the people around me. I could only influence myself. And what I discovered through that is it requires self-love right? And it requires the actions of self-loving behavior. And in becoming more loving toward me, it was a natural progression to become more loving toward everyone, everyone else, even the people I don't particularly like. (laughs) (laughs) Loving them is different and loving them frees me and loving them creates peace inside of my body and my heart and my mind. And, and then as I deepened in meditation and yoga, it just became so clear. It just seems very clear at this point that every, everything is connected. I think the more we study and the more we meditate and the more we experience this oneness and and believe it to be true, then, then it just becomes a part of us and everything is love. The tree is love the the mom who still pushes your buttons at 40 something (laughs) isn't that the truth (laughs) you know so it was just sort of a natural progression and also a practice you know I didn't sit around waiting to feel like I was connected to everything and that everything was love I practiced it and tried it on and felt how it felt and it felt really good it feels really good and I know that if I step out of love it doesn't feel so good and so my goal for my own self to be the best version of me, to be the best parent, to be the best friend is to always return back to that full feeling and awareness that I am love and we are all just one big blob of love. (laughs) (laughs) That's a great answer. That's a perfect answer. I had a different experience. <laughs> I being as raised as devoutly Catholic as my family was, we were like deep Catholics. We were like, you know, serious, like my mom had her master's degree in liturgy. <laughs> and so it was like huge. Um, so I had a lot of that, that, that guilt and that, that fear that was being thrust upon me by, by that. And then later on, um, I had, um, well, right now I have remembrances of a, of a, uh, very uh amazing spiritual teacher that i once uh, walked around with and um he uh he was an interesting fellow because when you walked near him all you felt was love Mm -hmm. and if 
it, well, I'll tell you an interesting experience I had with him one time. It was, um, <laughs> there was, a, there was a, a group of people who were arguing and he walked into the middle of it and just increased his love. And the fight stopped, the argument stopped. And it was just by being that presence. And so being able to see spiritual people do that kind of work and do that kind of change. It's when I, like I said, when I met you, Tamara, I, I could feel your presence when you walked in the room. Mm-hmm. It's the same thing. You're being, being love. It's being yes. that, that essence of love. Now, when you look at it from um, a deeper perspective, right? Love being this essence of, of everything is, is really an old Christian belief. Because in, in Judaism, uh, it was very much God's love. It was his separate love, and he, he endows it to us, right? It wasn't until uh, John the Apostle said, uh, God is love, that, that Christianity started taking that under their belt, right? Mm-hmm. And I like John. He's a great writer. And, um, <laughs> and then um, after, after that, you know, what's really interesting about religions in general is, is the carry on from one to the next. You know, Judaism did, was God's love was separate. When Jesus and Christianity came around, God's love became God is love, right? And then you went to Islam, and in Islam, they called it, I have it written down here, uh, Al-Wadud, Al-Wadud, which is um, the most loving. That's what they oh, called God, the most yeah. loving. But when you, when you break it down from Arabic, it breaks down to the divine essence is love. That's what that means. Okay. Uh, you know. So then you have that, and then you get into the Hindus, and Hindus actually believe God is love. Right. So then you start seeing this correlation of God being love across all platforms, right? right? All platforms. Now, going back to Islam again, right? Islam talks in, in specifically Sufism, which is uh, a, a sect of, of uh, Islam. Mm-hmm. Um, Sufis believe that, that there is, uh, they do a thing called the jihad al naf, and it's the struggle against the veil. And God is on one side of the veil, and we're on the other side of the veil, and it's the veil that we're struggling against, right? So we're to remove the the block, right, right, okay. right. And I believe that the barrier, the veil, is our fear. Yes, is our personal fear, right? Yeah. And when you look at when you look at the correlation between love, God being love, and fear, I think there's only one fear, and I think it's the fear of not being loved. Yes. <laughs> right. Right. <Yes. laughs> and I think that we are, God is, God is so loving and so caring that God gives us the creative ability to experience our separation from love so that we can come to know love full, fuller. Oh, that's so beautiful. That contrast that we need for every positive, right? The, right. If we can't, if, or we don't experience contrast, we don't know what the other thing is and it's not as sweet. Right. I, I absolutely agree. We, we agree on a lot of things. It is anytime we're in fear, we're out of love. And right. anytime we're in love, there is no fear. Right. I, I completely agree with that. And it's interesting because when you look at all the different spiritual texts, they all say that we're in control of our fear. You and know, people will argue. <laughs> and, and they will. <laughs> absolutely. That, yeah. <laughs> my, one of my favorite um, stories or, or one of the favorite... Uh, teachers that I've read about is a, a young man named Swami Narayan. And Swami Narayan, if you probably don't know who he is, he's a very unknown sort of guy, right? Back in the 1700s, he was, uh, he was an 11 year old boy who reached enlightenment, right? And he ended up doing a 13,000 kilometer trek around India to all the different holy sites. At one point, he walked over the Himalayas. He's known for uh, dressing like Mowgli from Jungle Book. <sighs> He always had a little loincloth on, right? And nothing right. else, right? And he walked over the Himalayas through the snow, came down the other side. And when they asked him how, how he didn't freeze to death on the mountain, he says, because I am without fear, cold does not affect me. And that, that was his first response. The second one, he wandered into a, a village where they had a problem with a man-eating lion who was coming at nighttime. And he wandered in the village at dusk and all the people said, young boy, come into our house for the night so that you won't get eaten by the lion. And he said, no, I'm good. And he said, I'm, I'm good. And he sat down by the tree and they came out the next morning and the lion's head was resting on his lap. And they said, because I, because I gave him, because I have no fear, he gave me nothing to be fearful for. Oh, yes. Mm-hmm. Okay. So it, was, it, was, it really comes down to this controlling of fear. Back to the idea of God being love. I, I kind of picture it as us being in a, a room made of love or the world made of love, right? Everything's mm-hmm. made of love. 
and we have right next to us a fog machine. <laughs> yes. <laughs> and that fog machine, we have our hand on that knob yeah. and we can see a little bit of fog or we can see a whole bunch of fog, right? <laughs> but it, it, it closes off our vision of, of what love really is. Mm -hmm. So that, that's how I see it. Do you have anything you want to throw at that? <laughs> yeah. Yes, actually. I like that image. And I feel like most of us are trying to collect some love. <laughs> right. you know, we're trying to gather up some love in our hands and maybe hold it for a little while instead of just stepping right into the water and immersing ourselves yeah. and remembering that. So instead of trying to hold little bits at a, of, at a time and watching it slip through our fingers and being afraid of the loss of that love, if we just get into the tub, right? Right, right, right. Or the ocean or the lake. I'm in Michigan, there are a lot of lakes. Um, we just get into that water and immerse ourselves. Then we realize we can't lose it. We're not separate. We're one with all that love. We're it's one all with that everything. We are. Yeah. And it works well to consider as also that uh, our human bodies are mostly water, right? So right, right. Love. If, if love and water are an analogy of one another, then we are that. That's right. it. Right. right. And when we get afraid that we're going to drown or we get afraid that it's too overwhelming or we just allow ourselves to step back into the gritty sand or, you know, dry off that fog, like you mentioned, comes up and we feel separate. It's, mm -hmm. it's not love. Love is scary to some people because we haven't experienced it, unfortunately, in, in our lives and growing up, we're taught mm -hmm. fear. Right. Right. We're taught fear. Oh, that's hot. You'll get burned. I did it to my own kids. Right. Oh, I scared them. So to keep them safe. Right. 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 So we've been taught to be fearful by the church, by the government, by our parents, by mm -hmm. our teachers, by our uh, bosses. <laughs> right. By, by sometimes by even by our experiences. Absolutely. Yeah. Mm -hmm. I mean, yeah. some, you get stung by a bee, you get to be afraid of bees, right? Of course you do. Right, right. <laughs> it hurts. Uh, but you know, the interesting thing about that is, is well, you, you have to define what, what fear is. Because, you know, a lot of people, they, they, you know, you say, what is fear? And they say, false evidence appearing real, right? And I'm like, no, it's not. You know, because fear actually doesn't come with evidence. Fear is an emotional reaction to some future event that may or may not happen with the focus on the outcome being a negative Yes. Right. It's yes. Just negatively yeah. focused on certainty. So the reality of it is, is, is that if you're truly living in your, your loving I am moment, your present moment, you know, you want to make sure that you are living that experience of love, of mm -hmm. being love. Now, when you break it out of spirituality and you drop it into quantum physics, you get something different, which is kind of cool because quantum physics goes into the idea of everything that you see and experience in the world is pure energy. Mm -hmm. Now you've got nothing but pure energy here. And the Bible says, you know, you are created in God's image. Well, yeah, you are. Everything you're ex experiencing is the image of the source, right? So yeah. you are created in that image. So if everything that you're experiencing around you is, is God and God is love, then you are surrounded and part of love constantly. And the only thing that changes our, our perception of that love is the, um, the choice to be fearful. Yes. So we get to choose our, 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 our pathway and our separation, but that's not, that's exactly what was promised. You know, whatever you want, I'll, you can have. Didn't say if you want negative stuff, I'm not going to give you that. No, no. He said, no, exactly. <laughs> you know, you I want. Was just teaching a workshop and I, that morning I was preparing <clears throat> and read, do you want to know what you truly want? Look around. Right. 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 You're getting what you want in your heart of hearts, right? What you, or what you think you can get and or what you believe exactly what you believe. And we're all projecting our beliefs out into the world. You talked about the Bhagavad Gita last week. And my favorite quote for that is, um, curving back on myself. I create again and again, right? Right. So everything that we believe we're actually projecting out into the world that we see. And so if you're fearful and think that you should be, then yes, you'll have things to be afraid of. You'll be fearful at work. You'll be fearful at home. You'll be fearful for your children. You'll be fearful, 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 and it's overwhelming and exhausting. And if through practice 
and patience, you can learn to lean back into love more and more, then all those fears and worries and anxiety start to drop off. And it's not easy. It's simple. It's not easy. <laughs> well, it, 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 I believe it's so simple that we make it complicated. We can't believe it's that simple. Right, because we're human and these brains are meant to solve problems that we create them so that we can solve them. Right, and Confucius talks about you know, we make the simple complicated, you know, and it's, it's, really, it's really an interesting thing because if God is love, then we all can choose to be love right here, right now. Mm -hmm. if, if God is love, you know, that teacher that I talked about a long time ago, you know, he, he, would, he would give you know, the shirt off his back to anybody he saw that needed it. Right. And it wasn't because of the fact that, you know, he was looking for a reward. It was just, it was just what he did, it's who he was. My mother, my, my, you know, my mother was a, you know, very much, as I said, very devout Catholic, mm -hmm. but my mother truly, she was a devout Catholic, but she lived her spirituality like it was the real doctrines. Right. And I'll give you an example. Um, I have a very good friend who, um, who, was also a Catholic family. That's why, you know, he was close to us because they had eight kids. We had seven, okay. right? <laughs> right. <laughs> and um, they were, they were struggling because the father of that family was, had debilitating arthritis and couldn't work. And the mother was working two jobs. She was actually our bus driver for school and they had eight kids. And one night I was, I was hanging out with the guy. We used to go to the bars and sing songs and do all kinds of crazy things. <laughs> and um, <laughs> we ended up, um, sitting around one night and we were just talking about stuff. And all of a sudden out of the blue, my friend says, you know, your mother's an angel. And I said, excuse me, how's that, how's that work? You know, she's still alive. You know? She's not, you know, she's got <laughs> yeah. no wings that I've seen. Right. He says, well, let me tell you a story about your mom that you probably don't know. I said, okay. He says, well, we were all sitting around uh, at my mom's house you know, as kids and mom had a family meeting. And she said, she says, kids, uh, we are out of money. I have no idea where the next money is coming from. I don't know where the next meal is coming from. Wow. And she says, I, I, I think we should pray. He says, and we all grabbed hands and we prayed. And then there was a knock on our door. And my, she says, my mom got up and walked over and opened the door. And your mom was standing outside the door with bags of groceries. And she walked in and she put them on the counter. And she walked back out and came in with a freshly made roast. Wow. That she had made so they'd have dinner that day. We never knew it. Oh my goodness. Mom just did those things because it's what you do. Yes. You do the loving thing. Right. Yes. And yes. so I, I'm very lucky because when I went into my search for spirituality, um, I had a <laughs> I had a, a very interesting, I'm a firm believer in reincarnation, as you know, Tamara. Yes. <laughs> and uh when I when um my mom heard about my experiences with, with reincarnation and past life stuff. Uh, she went to the, the, the parish priest and she told him everything about was she worried. <laughs> she, was was she, she, was, she was like, yeah, she, she said, I'm worried about my son because he believes this, 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 this. And the Catholic priest turned around to, to her and said, don't discount it. It might be true. Okay. But, okay. So there's, there is real spirituality in all religions. Yes. There is people who are open to the source being, loving and caring and being around us at all times, you know, yes. and I want to another time do an entire episode on reincarnation because that'll be a fun episode. That would be fun. That would be <laughs> very fun. So why do you think that uh, the church specifically has over many, many years utilized fear as a tool? Like why is it that God moved from being love and pure love and we're all able to access that we need only choose to to we should be god fearing okay well there's, there's a couple reasons first first of all you're, you're specifically framing that from the christian perspective but if yes. you go back to go back to the judas judaism you know the old testament is full of you know he smited that village and that village smited that village and they killed that army and blah 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 there's a whole bunch of crazy violent stuff in the yeah. old testament right then you get into Christianity. Now, Christianity was very interesting because Judaism is the forerunner of Christianity, right? So for Jesus to be Jesus, he had to be a Jewish person to be the Messiah. So, okay. so he became the Messiah. Now, the people of the Jewish faith don't believe that. 
right? They, they, right. they don't believe that. So what happened was the Jewish faith was a very, very powerful faith at the time. The only other one that was as power, powerful at the time was the Roman pagan faith. Okay. Okay. So you have these two conflicting things. Now, suddenly, <laughs> oh, I'm dropping all kinds of history on you today. <laughs> I know I'm soaking up the learning. <laughs> um, so so what, what happens is Jesus comes along and he starts getting a following. People start saying he's the one, he's the one, he's the one. And then for 300 years, he was, he was this, this mystical thing, you know, mm -hmm. this as very esoteric, you know, he had, he had complete beliefs in, in everything you can possibly imagine. They find reincarnation in the writings. They find everything in the writings from, from, from Jesus. Okay. That faith started to grow in a big, big way. Then the Romans said, well, they're outnumbering us. And it's like, we can split the Jewish faith by, by building up Christianity. And so they came in the first, and the first thing they did at the Nicene Council was they took out all the books that said that uh, the power was within you. And they put the okay. power, they put all the power in God, a separate God. Okay. And that separate God was used to um, hold power over the people, right? And so then you have all the situations of, you know, um, as you get into the later periods, the Renaissance, the medieval times, um, the church grew to such extent that, you know, to get into heaven, wealthy people would, would donate their lands. You know? right. And so it was like, that's a powerful tool. Right, right. So they, <laughs> yeah. were con they were constantly using all these things. And then the power of the church was, you know, you know, who's going to handle this? And the priest would go in and say, well, the king wants this. So let's go get them the lands from the church. Okay. So then, and then of course, over time, you end up going to like Henry VIII, who, you know, wanted to divorce his first wife. And so he said, well, then I'm, I'm no longer part of the Catholic faith. I'm now part of the Protestant, you know, the, the new, the church of England, you know, I'm, and I'm the head of it so I can do anything I want. Right. So, <laughs> so it becomes very malleable, but what's interesting is, is all the things that happened in, in using fear as a tool to keep people down was all about holding power. It, Correct. It was all about yeah. just holding power and not only power over, over the people individually, but over the financials. Mm -hmm. And they really wanted to, to, to make the money off it too. So yes. it's a very, it's a very contentious thing. But if you go back, you know, no matter how they use fear to, to hold people down and get their money or whatever, mm -hmm. and you just look at all of the different spiritual texts, you find, you find the God is love in most of them. Mm -hmm. You find, you find that, that universal truth that's out there. And I think you really need to, because I re you really need to look at all all spirituality and find the things that are that are consistent, because I don't think that if you the the mind of man can comprehend what God really is, and I think that the more you can take all of the all of the various things and find the commonalities, you get closer to understanding. Yes, and I, I think it's incomprehensible, but I think that the idea that God is love is such an esoteric statement. But I tell you what, if you feel love. From somebody, if you feel, even you know, I'm not talking about romantic love. I'm just talking about the the, mm -hmm. the presence of love. Yes, you feel the presence of love, and it is it is world changing, you know. Mm -hmm. And that guy that I talked about before, he could walk into a room and change the room, mm -hmm. and and actively consciously increase his vibration, as they would say in quantum physics, right? Right. It, it would be, increase the vibration, and then the room would calm down, right? Mm -hmm. So mm -hmm. it. The, the thing is, is, you know, even in Christianity, they say, what is it? Lo, that I walk through the valley of the shadow of death. I shall fear no evil for, you know, thou art with me. Well, if God is love and you are created in God's image, then God is always with you. Mm -hmm. And so you should have no fear. Yeah. So choose not to have it. Right. Choose <laughs> love instead. And I, I would invite all of our listeners the next time they have the the opportunity to walk into a room full of people, which right. is limited at this point, but to play with that, to play with your own energy and, um, and really start to like, you can do it by thinking of somebody that you really love, right? Think of somebody who brings you so much joy, so much love that your face starts to, you know, upward tilt into a smile and you just start to glow with that love and then hold on to it and, and kind of push it out into the room around you so that 
you know, even imagine yourself enveloping everybody around you with that love and watch things shift, you know, and just watch the impact, watch people's body language shift. And if you happen to be in a position to actually work the room, you know, if you're a speaker or you're an events coordinator or you're the boss or you're leading a meeting, even a leading, leading a meeting in a corporate environment, right? This is the perfect place to just play with love and see how it shifts the energy in a small room or a big room. Right. You know, because that, I mean, you talk about the first time we met, that's what I do for right. fun, right? <laughs> I just hope And I, I witnessed it. I love. totally witnessed you change the room. And then I got to do that on a professional basis every day for four and a half years, you know, just walking into a room full of seniors who I love so much and holding them right with this Mm. loving energy so that they could feel happiness and excitement and love. And all, all of those words are just other words for love, right? So I just invite our listeners to practice embodying that feeling of love and noticing how close to source and spirit you actually feel in that moment. And, you know, if you're somewhere warm, sit in nature because it's all around you there, you know, and remember too, that love is pure perfection. And when we go into doubt, fear, or lack, we're forgetting our own perfection and we're forgetting our own beingness of love. And it just, be, I know people are going to ask, well, how do I get there? How do I do it? How do I embody love? You practice. Right. That's it. And, and, and you, you get to touch it every time you laugh truly. Mm-hmm. When you're laughing truly, I mean, Buddha said, <laughs> when you see how perfect everything is, you'll tilt your head back and laugh at the sky. Yeah. Right. And you think about that, that quote, you tilt your head back and laugh at the sky. You know, you're, you're so happy and joyful to be in a certain place and a certain space. Um, I love when, when I go into a restaurant and I get a, a grumpy waiter or waitress and I, before I leave that restaurant, they will laugh mm-hmm. they will, because I purposely am, am changing their experience. You know, like remember they're grumpy. I said, you look like you're having a hard day. Uh, why don't you sit down and eat and I'll go ahead and handle your tables. <laughs> and I get up and I, you know, <laughs> and I start just making jokes with them. When I walk on stage, I know Tamara, you saw me speak. And I walk yeah. on stage. The first minute that I'm on stage, I make a joke because I want the, the audience to laugh first. Mm, I love that. I want them in that space of joy. And I'm, I make jokes all the way through everything I do anyway, because it's just what I, who I am and what I do. I find yeah. the world funny. But in finding the world funny, I am literally living my experience of love mm-hmm. and, and bringing that experience out. So anyway. Yeah. Well, this has been an amazing one. We have we have made it all the way through, I believe. So, um, have any parting words from you, Tamara Zoner? <laughs> well, yeah, come back next time because we'll talk more about that separation, that struggle, right? When we're out of love, and uh, we'll keep sharing how cool it is to be spiritual without all the BS <laughs> <laughs> and how, how you can make it your own. So keep coming back for more of that. And I just want to thank you, John, for your wealth of knowledge and your wisdom. And this is so much fun. I look forward to the next one. Well, thank you, Tamara. And thank you for all your, your experiences. And thank you really for just being you because, you, you know, I have, the, like I said before, I have the book learning that mm-hmm. you're living it. And I, and I just love to watch you live in it. So, all right, guys, we will talk to you on the next one and have a great time. And I will, we will see you later. Bye. For comments and suggestions, please visit us at Spirit Cafe Podcast on Facebook or spiritcafepodcast.com.